Thank you, Les, for the sign changes that you've been doing lately. It's been awesome, and the grounds work awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. Good, good. So, well, let's bow for a prayer before we get into the Word of God. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that you have given to us your word that we can learn to live by. We also can learn that we have hope through through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray right now that you would bless this time, bless your word, and help us to pay attention to the message that you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the passage we're going to be looking at today is, G is Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. It's probably a story that most of us are familiar with. It's the story of Cain and Abel. And this message today is so closely tied with Genesis chapter 3, we have to understand that and keep that in mind. But let's read this passage together. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. And again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do will, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, for which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the field, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden. And I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, so that no one would find, finding him would slay him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Thanks be to God for his wonderful word. When I was in the army, I worked alongside with another soldier that, uh, who always seemed to be uh, not getting in trouble, but it was almost as if uh, his squad leader, which was my squad leader as well, seemed to almost have it in for him and would find him and almost look for all the bad things that he could do and punish him for every single time he did something. And... There, it, it was very frustrating for this young man. And it was just like the punishments were for the smallest things. And I had talked with, talked with him before, and he thought of himself as a Christian, and maybe he was. I don't know. I don't know his heart. But it got to the point where he was so many times where he were called out for the tiniest little things that he was so frustrated because there would be times when the squad leader would get all these things lined up for him, and he had to do so many different things that it would take him till the wee hours in the morning, and he'd have to be back in formation at like six in the morning the next morning, and he would be tired, he'd be making mistakes, and then he'd be using those mistakes against him. It was one big revolving wheel. 
And it was very frustrating, and he was getting very angry at his squad leader. And I could tell this. And remember one time I had to, we had to take turns kind of watching in the barracks, the hallways. One of the nights it was my turn. And as he was working because of the, the squad leader putting him through all these things, I could see the frustration. He was saying, ah, I just want to kill this guy. And it got to the point, because this was months later, he wasn't just saying that rhetorically. I mean, he was talking about a places of when, and I was just going, okay, this guy needs help. He needs help bad. And he thought he was at the point of no return. And I told him, not just as a soldier, but I, I, I appealed to him in his faith, and, and I said that he needed to repent of that, of that attitude. And, and, he, and I knew he was extremely frustrated. I knew what, that what, I could see it in his behavior. I could see that he was just about to lose it. And I talked with him after that several different times, but one of the things I said is, I know that you know, your squad leader is caught, our squad leader, I should say, has, is really putting you out really hard and calling you out for all these mistakes. But, and I don't want to make a comparison, a direct comparison, but I said, in the Bible, there's a story about Cain. And one of the things that God said to Cain after he did not have regard for Cain's sacrifice, it says, if you do well, your countenance will be lifted. And he, he took that to heart. I really believe that he did because it seemed to, to, and I had to mention this quite a few times, I said, there was a second chance for Cain. There was that second chance for him. And I said, and I believe that's the same for every single one of us. I'm just like Cain in so many ways. I'm just, you're just like Cain in so many ways. We all are like Cain in so many ways. When we fall, when we, if we, do well if we get back up, if we give glory to God and we worship him, then guess what? We can have our countenance lifted back up. But if you master your sin and if you don't let this sin just eat you up. So Cain had a second chance. And this is kind of where we're going to be looking at today. Cain had opportunities he could have taken. And so did my friend. And like I said, I believe that he did well. He needed encouragement, and no one was giving that to him. And <clears throat> I had left. I don't know the whole thing that happened, but I do, I do know that I don't think he killed him or anything like that, but I do know <laughs> that he did well. And I was very happy to see that. I was just overjoyed with the fact that, you know, I was able to help another brother in the Lord. And I really believe he was. I don't know his heart exactly, but I believe he was. And like I said, in the same way, we all have choices. And we can either, as in the bulletin today, I put down for the, the title of the message is God's desire for our repentance. But if you look up at the notes, it says the type of the top, title is the painful path of unrepentance. And both those titles, I think, fit well with what we're going to be talking about today. And so let's start at the verse where it says, Now Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Now what's interesting is, is in this verse, um, some people, there's some um, theologians believe that when we look at this, you'll notice in the passage the words, the help of are in italics, so that's not in the original. That's not in the original. That's in the translation into English. How we see it. Some theologians believe that when Eve gave birth at this time, she was um, believing that this was that 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 Messiah, that um, seed that would crush the head of the serpent that we had just learned about in Genesis chapter 15. Because remember, God gave the promise when he was speaking to Satan, saying that the seed of the woman would crush the head of Satan. And obviously, I do believe that she probably thought, 
here's my chance. I'm going to, with this child with that, that I have obtained from the Lord, this is going to be the one that crushes the head of Satan. And I could see her rejoicing in this child that she has obtained. And so it's very possible that she believed that her firstborn child would be that one that would crush the head of the serpent. And Eve, the mother of living then, through Adam, gives birth to another son. And and we, as we look at that, it says in verse 2, and again, she gave birth to Abel, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And these two names, again, Cain is, uh, uh, means acquired or gotten or obtained. She obtained her salvation, or so she thought. And Abel means breath or vapor. And Ecclesiastes makes a play on this, and this when we get to the book of Ecclesiastes, it starts talking about vanity of vanities, or vapor of vapors, as when it speaks about here. And this is a play, because a lot of times when we look at Abel, we look at the short life that he had, and the vainness of this life. And a lot of times when we read the book of Ecclesiastes, we often think there's a phrase that I remember not from the Bible, but one that almost fits very well with it, that no good deed goes unpunished. And it's almost as if in Abel's situation, this is what happened. But again, the vocations of these two uh, men, Cain was a tiller of the ground, he was a farmer, and Abel was a keeper of the flocks. He was a shepherd. And then we read about, it says, and it came about in the course of time. And over the process of time, after, after God had clothed um, Adam and Eve with skins, which were from an animal that was slain, there was instituted the sacrificial system. There was, and God had given them specific plans, giving them specific regulations, saying this is what needs to be done. And so Hebrews 11 and 12 does give us an idea when we look at this passage about that gives us a huge hint as to what took place. And when we read Hebrews chapter 11, we read that this morning. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then down further, it says, by faith, the very first person that the author of Hebrews mentions, it says, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. Now, the one thing I do know is, is as we look at Cain and Abel, Okay, it's Abel, he's, he's a shepherd. He's going to give the best of his flock. And, and I'm sure that Abel thought, well, I know God gave us these requirements, but I think I'm going to give him the best of what I have. I'm going to see what God thinks about that. Even though he told me to do this over here, because Hebrews tells us also in Hebrews 9 that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to do it this way. Instead of following what God had told him to do, he said, I'm, I, I love God, so I'm going to give him the best of what I have instead of following the, what God told me to do. And I could see him in his feeling all wonderful and joyful in, in this moment of presenting this offering. And, and I can almost see how if God did not have regard for it, how his countenance would fall all of a sudden. <clears throat> but then, as we look at this, it, it, we understand that, again, faith, he was not following God's word. He was not obeying what God told him to do. He was not being faithful, nor what did he listen. Faith, by definition, is listening to God's word, taking him at his word, and following God's word. <clears throat> and so, as we see this, this is why it says in Hebrews chapter 11, when in 11 chapter 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice through Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. 
I think it's kind of ironic that the author of Hebrews uses that word obtain in verses of the name of, of Cain, which means obtain. Abel obtained the righteousness. He had regard with God. And I think it's a, an ironic thing for us to, to look there and to understand that because of what he offered, well, he did not obtain, because of what Cain offered, he did not obtain righteousness. And so when we look then at verse 5 through 10, we see the loss of composure and countenance and the conflict. And like I say, we see Cain, he's all happy, and he's going, look what I did. And then God has no regard for that offering that he gave. And another way to uh, describe it in our English vernacular that his countenance fell is he lost his composure. That might be one way to think about it. Have you seen someone lose their composure over, yeah, you know, okay, because you didn't get what you want, they flat out lose it. And so he became very angry and his countenance fell. <clears throat> and you can see in this passage, as we go through this passage, and we're going to be looking at the book of James as well alongside this, how James, under the inspiration of God, may even look at the, the life of Abel in James chapter uh, 1, verses 14 through 15, when he talks about the outline of the growth of sin. James says it like this, But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust or passions, and when that lust or passions has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And in some way, this is that pathway that took place for Cain. But one of the interesting things as we look at this passage is when God talks to Cain, he talks to Cain in the same way he talked to Adam and Eve. How is that? He asked questions. He, he's asking questions. He goes, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? Where is Abel, your brother? What have you done? And remember the questions that were asked to Adam and Eve. Where are you? Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I, didn't com I commanded you not to eat? Or what is this you have done again over that? I mean, it's, it, God is um, using questions to draw out a response of, of Adam and Eve. And in this instance, uh, to draw out the response of, of Cain for us to have that admission, for us to have that confession and that ability to, to be humble and come forth and have contriteness and hopefully to have a, a penitent and a remorseful heart. And we have to understand, though, that we are dealing with the enemies of God's people, us. And what are those enemies? And that's the world and the flesh and the devil. And we see, saw in chapter 3, the enemy was the devil. And in this passage, we see that enemy as the flesh. And, and this is what we're what Cain is dealing with. And so we have the, the, the passions of the flesh. So Cain gives in to the passions of the flesh. He gives into that anger. He gives into that hardness of heart and that jealousy, uh, being jealous of Abel's uh, accepted offering, but most of all, that prideful, stubborn, and unrepentant heart. And from verses 5 to 8, we begin to see James begin to play out his verses 14 and 15, play out in narrative fashion as we read this. And at the same time, we don't see Cain taking what I call the spiritual off-ramp of 1 Corinthians 10, chapters 12 and, and, and 13. Chapter, and what's the spiritual off-ramp? The spiritual off-ramp is this. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has take, overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation 
will provide a way to escape also so that you will be able to endure it. How many of you have ever gone down a big long hill where you see truckers where they have to really slow down? And in fact, there's one, if you're driver driving from, from Idaho on I-84, it's called Cabbage Hill. And as you're going down that hill, you see truckers going really slow. And the reason why they're going so slow is they don't want to go out of control. And, but that sometimes there has been that happen. And, and how many of us seen those off ramps that are just full of soft gravel? That's a, this is in, in, in a, what I see as that spiritual safety off ramp for us. God provides those through our life so many times and places. And he's provided this with, with Abel as we're going to take a look at this here because he says in verse 7, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. In other words, I'm going to give you off ramps. I'm going to give you places where you can escape from plummeting down, hurting yourself, damaging yourself, killing yourself, or damaging and hurting other people. And I think that's an important thing for us to understand even in our life that when we start to head down these paths, we have opportunities to turn back, to repent, and be um, contrite in our life and in our living when we are sinning against God. And so that is what he has had the opportunity. He has had the opportunity to do well, or as uh, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us, to escape. But but he seems dead set on putting the pedal to the metal and just going all the way down the hill no matter what happens here. He followed it to the death, to the death of Abel and to his own cursing. And the questions that God asked him didn't bring about that contriteness. It didn't bring about that remorse. But what, how did Cain respond? It was with that flippant rhetorical question. And he goes, am I my brother's keeper? And that was even after he had killed his brother. But I think that one of the things when we look at this passage, he says, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Well, you can almost say the lion of sin got the best of Cain. When you read that passage, the picture that God is giving to Cain here says sin is crouching at the door. How many of you have house cats? Maybe a lot. Maybe you know what house cats do. They like to ambush us, don't they? They like to hide around the corner and you see them do their little butt wiggle and all of a sudden they jump out and they pounce on your leg. But that's even true in the wild. They crouch, they get down there, and they wiggle. I mean, the big lions, the leopards, and the pumas, they do this as they're preparing to attack their prey. They crouch. And where do our house cats like to crouch behind? The door. And they hide, like to hide behind that. So he's saying, if you do not do well, sin is going to eat you alive. It's going to master you. It's going to control you. And that's the thing we need to understand. A lot of people think, when it comes to this world, that God does not, he, when it comes to free will and choice, a lot of people say, well, God didn't make us robots. Well, that's true, but sin does. Because guess what? When we begin to sin and we do not repent, we end up following one thing after another and we lose control of our will and we end up like Romans 7, like Paul the Apostle says, the things that I want to do I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Sin controls us if we let it. And that's, we have basically, we have let sin, we have let the lion of sin pounce on us and eat us. And this is what happens with, with Cain. In a lot of ways, he was angry at his brother Abel. In other words, he let Abel live inside his head rent free. He was able to just, it consumed him in all his thoughts. 
that the fact that his little brother outdid him at the sacrifices and he was upset and this and, and it's understandable on some levels when we just look at it at a superficial level he let it dwell and the anger grew until he finally just exploded and he slew his brother but then we see God when he gave him the curse. And this is God's curse and Cain's complaint. And he says, now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength for you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Now, let's go back and take a look. Cain, what, what, is, what was his job? What did he like to do? He was a, his vocation. He was a tiller of the ground. And I have an idea. He was an excellent tiller of the ground. I think he enjoyed that work, which is why he wanted to give an offering of that, because he did so well. Yes, he still had the thorns and thistles that came from Genesis chapter 3 from his parents, but he knew how to nurture the ground and how to bring things to life and make things grow really well. He, he was proud of his work. Of, his, of accomplishments and the benefits that he brought to himself and to his family. And if, if God says to him, you are cursed from the ground, it will no longer yield its strength for you. Can you imagine how he would have felt if, he, if God took that very thing that he loved to do away from him, or at least took away, sapped the power and the strength out of him as he wanted to bring things to grow, that things would not grow fully the way he wanted it to, he would be quite upset. And I, that's almost understandable. But this is the result of his sin. God cut off his handiwork, his first love. And that's the problem. It was his first love. Instead of listening to God and saying, God, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to listen to your word. Here's the offering that I want to bring to you. I'm going to bring to you from the things that I love. Instead of listening to God, he said, I'm going to love God my way. And so he, he brought these things. And because Abel's blood was spilled on the ground, God's curse against him involved the ground. And, and as we read this passage, as we're looking at it, we don't see Cain at any time saying, God, I've done horrible. I, I, I don't want to be kicked out of uh, uh, from uh, your presence. Uh, what can I do? What can I do to make it up? He could have returned back at any time. And even after he slayed his brother, he could have said, how horrible have what I have done. I, I beg for repentance. And I'm sure that God would have provided a way. But instead, how would he say? Your brother's, and he goes, where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? He knew good and well where his brother was. And so he says, behold, you have driven me from the face of the ground, and your face will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer, and whoever finds me will kill me. And the first question that a lot of people have when we read this passage is a lot of people will say, who are these people that he's talking about? Isn't it just Adam and Eve and, 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 and then Cain and Abel? Well, the answer lies to, the, to that question in the nature of the Bible. See, the Bible is a story of redemption. And we have to understand that this is the narrative that we're seeing here. God doesn't give an exhaustive history of the world. But he gives us the story of redemption of what we need. You know, we also have to understand we don't know the timeline of when these things took place. We do not know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden before they sinned. We don't know how long Adam and Eve had been giving birth maybe to other children, to girls, and to many other children. We don't know the situation here, but we do know that they were probably alive for a while because these were grown adult children, and I'm sure Adam and Eve didn't wait, you know, 15 years before they had their next child. But that would be what we would often see here is where were these other people that when Cain says, whoever finds me will, will kill me. 
But then the Lord gives an answer to that question. And he says, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. And I wouldn't call this as much grace as, as I would call this lenience, what God gave to him at this time. But again, his response to this curse isn't, God, I, I, I don't want to be from away from your presence. In fact, he says, behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground and from your face I will be hidden. God never said in the curse above that, that his face would be hidden. That was Cain's assumption. That or that, or that was Cain's statement. I'm going to hide my face from you because he ends up doing that. It says at the end of that passage, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and he left him. He wasn't concerned about his sin, about, he, about his shame against God. He was concerned about his shame as he wandered the world and, and his view in front of the, the rest of the world. He wasn't concerned about his relationship with Yahweh. He was concerned about his relationship and how it looked to the rest of the world. But then we have Cain's cleaving when he finally makes that cleave from God and leaves God in the presence of God. It says, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And I want us to take a look at this and understand that when we see this leniency that God gives him, what was that leniency? That the vengeance of God would be sevenfold against anyone who would take Cain's life. But that also is in contrast to what God has told us. Because Cain, for all intents and purposes, is, is a marked man in many ways. He's marked by God. But I think also as people begin to learn who Cain was, that he was the first murderer, that he did these things, there were going to be people that would have, a, uh, have a, an out for him and want to, to kill him to get rid of such a, a, a vagrant, to get rid of a murderer on this planet. But in the process, they would become a murderer as well. And the vengeance, God says, would be for, for him to take place. And God reiterates that type of vengeance taking all the way into the New Testament. Um, we even find this that um, in, in, in Matthew 18. And then we also find this in other places in Romans chapter 12. It says, Peter came and said to the Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. This passage was brought to my attention as I looked at that. And it says, this is God's new covenant with us. And no longer is a plan of vengeance, but it's a plan of forgiveness that God has given to us. And as we even looked at this passage um, that where we just read here, instead of vengeance sevenfold against us, God has forgiven us 70 times seven. Now, now the sum of that 70 times seven, 490, is not the limit of God's forgiveness. That's a way, his way of saying it's unbounding, it's limitless. And this is the same type of forgiveness that we need to be giving other people. Other people that run into Cain, they would be going, how could you? And they would want to murder him for what he had done and dead against all mankind being the first murderer. And they would want to kill him. And they would not want to, they, in other words, they wanted to take vengeance into their own hands instead of forgiveness. But the Lord's prayer, the Lord's uh, prescription for prayer, as we put it, is, is that we read each uh, during our worship time, what does God call us to do? To forgive others how? In the same way that we forgive other people. So how do we forgive other people? And I think that's the question of the day for us. Not to take vengeance, but rather to forgive. To be unboundless in our forgiveness. 
and, and, and I think that is just an important thing for us, for us to understand. He, he reiterated this as well in many other places that we see in, in, in the Gospels especially. I think that one of the things that we can take away from this is that forgiveness is really the hallmark of a Christian. It's really one of the, the points that when the people from outside this world, from outside our church, from people that are not believers, as they look into our church life, they understand and see that we are people that lift each other up, that forgive each other, and we help each other. Even when we have points, when we have struggles with each other here in our Christian faith, yes, as Christian families, we have conflicts with each other, but at the same time, we forgive each other, we love each other, and we demonstrate that, not take vengeance on one another, even when someone does something that may hurt us. But Cain, on the other hand, he did not. He put his foot on the gas pedal, and he pushed headed straight downhill. You see, Cain was not a believer in any way. He did not have faith. And in fact, we often think about um, when it talks about Cain in the New Testament, it, in Jude, he says, woe to them, talking about false teachers, for they have gone the way of Cain. And we also find in other passages in 1 John, it says that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Why did he slay Abel? Because Cain's deeds were evil and his brother Abel's were righteous and he was jealous of those things. And a lot of times I hear people say, and I've even heard someone say recently that we're all children of God. Every single one of us are children of God. But that's not true. We see here, right here in this passage, where he says, um, Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. Jesus, when he was talking to the Pharisees, how did he tell them? You are of your father, the devil. We're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. Abel was of God's children. And I think that's important for us to think and understand that distinction as we hear people talk. I don't want to say or catch myself saying that we're all children of God. We're all creation of God. We're all created in the image of God, but we're not all God's children. We're not, his, we're not all of us. The Bible tells us many are called, but few are chosen. Abel's sacrifice was chosen. Cain had an opportunity. He, he had an opportunity, but he kept not taking the spiritual offering, not taking that opportunity to repent and come back. And each time, it pushed him further and further down that road of, of sin that was mentioned in James when it says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and is enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brother. My hope and prayer is that for everyone here, we're not deceiving ourselves and thinking I'm okay. Because guess what? I know that every single one of us have points, and I'm guilty of this myself, of heading down that path with the foot to the gas and not looking for any safety off ramps which God has provided. And I know that's something that we need to be careful attention to because we have to be looking for the off ramps because why? We're all born in sin. We all have that sin nature. We all have that bent to take that pathway, to go downhill without looking for the off-ramps. So my prayer is, I hope we are all looking for the off-ramps. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have provided a way of escape, that you have provided us with the way to deal with our temptation, that you do not tempt us beyond what we are able, but we can endure it. And as James tells us, this will make us stronger, uh, better, 
believers. And Lord, I pray right now that you would just give each one of us the, the assurance and the conviction to deal with sin in our life. And I don't know everyone's heart here, Lord, but I know you do. And they know their hearts. They know where they are dealing with sin. And we pray, Lord, that you would convict them so that they can do well, so that their countenance and composure can be lifted up and be a shining light for you in this world to share your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, worship with one last song.